Allô, Robert Franklin, arrivez Allô, Robert Franklin, arrivez It is Saturday evening, November 7th, 1942, when this message is broadcasted by the BBC throughout the Vichy French colonies in North Africa. Hundreds of agents and resistant members jump into action. For tomorrow morning, before dawn, Allied forces will land on the beaches at Casablanca, Oran and Algiers. General Giraud will take control and order the Vichy army to lay down its arms and Vichy loyalists will be captured or even killed. That way, British and American can conquer North Africa. This is Operation Torch. Boom, bam, done. Simple as simple does, but that is not quite the whole story. So, listen up. This is another episode of Spies and Ties. I'm Astrid Dinehart. Hello, darlings. Later that night, in a small office room, deep in a mountain in the British colony of Gibraltar, several men have gathered to monitor the proceedings of the operation. One of the men in that room is Supreme Commander of the whole thing, American General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Here he is. By his side is Lieutenant Colonel Bill Eddy. Here he is. He works for the US intelligence services, the OSS, and has been preparing for this day for almost a year. His boss, Wild Bill Donovan, you recall, uh, I made a video about him, and here he is again, calls him his Lawrence of Arabia. He is a decorated, experienced intelligence man with a record going back to World War I. As a result of that war, he has a pronounced limp after having his hip shot to pieces by German machine gunners at Billow Wood. In any case, from within the Gibraltar mountains, Eddie closely tracks the operation's progress through a steady flow of incoming reports from his many radio networks all over North Africa. Meanwhile, Wild Bill is waiting in his Washington headquarters, anxious for news about the biggest operation to date for his OSS. Finally, a message reaches his desk. It's from Eddie. Thank God, all well. So, it looks like Eddie's plans are working out, right? One big reason for that is that the Allies have cracked the German codes. For Torch, they spent months tracking troop, plane, ship and U-boat numbers and movements. Perhaps most crucially, they try to find out if the enemy knows that they are coming. They do not. You see, the developing disaster in Stalingrad is taking most of the Germans' attention. And for more and more commanders, the African theater has become an annoying sideshow. When the Japanese ambassador to Berlin warns that an invasion of North Africa is coming, he is ignored. Instead of reinforcing, planes are withdrawn to the east and U-boats sent into the Atlantic. Then, in the late days of October and now in early November, countless Allied convoys are sailing through the narrow strait of Gibraltar. And the Germans begin to suspect something. Not the right thing, though. German Luftwaffe commander Smiling Albert Kesselring thinks that they are heading to Malta and prepares an ambush there. That's why, way to the east, one single U-boat manages to attack the torch convoys, disabling a U.S. transport ship. The Allies also know that Spain will stay neutral and that the Vichy French Navy at Toulon will remain where it is, polishing their steel and swabbing decks, happily unaware of any coming troubles. But there is a more complex moving piece in this game. 
and that is the 8 French Division in North Africa. Will they lay down their arms and join the Allies or put up a serious fight? Ideally, the former should be prepared in advance, right? So, finally, we get to my friends, the spies. Now, if you've seen the film Casablanca, you'll know what kind of environment we're talking about in the middle of World War II, raging on the other side of the Mediterranean and across Sahara to the east, French North Africa is a hotspot of diplomacy, espionage and trade. And like Sam plays it again in the film, so do our spies in reality. You guys remember Mikshis Love Zygrod Slobikowski, aka Rigor, for my Polish spying episode? Here he is. He's now left the spy business and started an important porridge manufacturing company delivering all over North Africa. <laughs> okay, that's not true. It's just a cover for Agency Africa with operations in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, and Dakar. By early 42, he has dozens of spies and operatives with hundreds of informants and agents weaved into all the colonies and North Africa, France, Algeria is part of France proper, remember? What about Great Britain and the US, you say? Hmm. In the smoky bars and cafes of Casablanca, the diplomatic cover for spies should work, right? But remember how the Royal Navy blew the French fleet out of the water of Mers el Kibir in 1940? So, the French and British are not talking, but the US have full diplomatic relations to Vichy. So, once the US enters the war, our crazy friend Wild Bill gets Africa. That's where he sent Eddie already in January 42. He goes to Tangier, Morocco, disguised as a naval attaché in his luggage. One million dollars. Money that is inserted into Rigo's formidable agency Africa network. Soon, radio stations in Tangier, Algiers, Tunis and Casablanca are beeping away and listening, and a small army of European and native guerrilla warriors are assembling across Morocco. Meanwhile, another American, Robert Daniel Murphy, U.S. Consul General in Algeria, he is, negotiates with the French that the colonies shall be allowed to import American consumer goods. But only, listen up, if 12 U.S. custom officers can oversee the progress to make sure that nothing is passed on to the Axis forces. They are, of course, spies who become known as Roswell's 12 Apostles, collecting intelligence on French and Axis dealings in North Africa. So, with endless pages of reports on defensive structures, troop movements, numbers, supply lines, all that remains is to convince the Vichy army to defect to the Allied side. Famously, to convince a Frenchman, you should use a Frenchman. That's how it is. Enter Jacques Lemargue du Brule, codenamed Peanut, because he's a peanut oil magnet. Here he is, but he is also a far-right supporter, well-connected in fascist, Vichy and Nazi circles. An unlikely candidate for helping the Allies, right? Well, he's also the leader of the Group of Five, an assembly of French capitalists and monarchists hoping to seize power in North Africa. Hmm. These are unusual times in an unusual place. And as Rick says to Louise at the end of Casablanca, Eddie says to Peanut, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. 
Pinat travels to Lyon, where he meets up with his former military commander, Henri Giraud, whom, as you will know from Indy, is the French general who just escaped German custody and now enjoys Patin's protection in the free zone. Murphy brands Giraud a noble puppet, someone he can use to sway the French army officers in North Africa. In the late summer of 42, Eisenhower sends in Major General Mark Clark, here he is, via submarine to judge the situation for himself. His report reads, anticipate that the bulk of the French army and air forces will offer little resistance. All that Rigor and Eddie have to do now is to make sure that invasion goes smoothly. Agents use flares on the beaches to guide the troops ashore. Resistant groups and guerrilla bands are standing by to take over local governments, radio stations and other strategic positions. 80,000 rebels will spread chaos in Spanish Morocco as diversion and a huge nine feet radio antenna is to guide 556 paratroopers to capture two important airfields. 400 guerrilla fighters trained by Peanut take the French 19th Corps headquarters. Radio Algier and some other important buildings in Algier as well. Ships are met by French guides waiting for them on the beaches and Peanut makes his way to the Bleeder airfield in Algier to meet General Giraud, who is to address the nation and end the fighting. It's at this point that Eddie wires to Donovan that, you know, you remember, thank God, all is well, which is true. But like Helmut von Moltke once said, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. The center of Algiers is quickly retaken by Vichy loyalists before the Americans are even close. French officers aren't defecting as expected. The size of promised guerrilla force is disappointing and Giraud, he's not at the airfield to meet Peanut. When he arrived in Gibraltar, he suddenly demanded that Eisenhower appoint him absolute supreme commander of the entire operation. Eisenhower refuses and Giraud only accepted to play ball after wasting hours being angry about that. And when he finally does arrive on the 9th, it becomes clear that Giraud doesn't really have any authority over the French officers anyway. As Indy explains in his episode, the situation is saved when Vichy Admiral Francois Darlan is in Algiers, visiting his son and is persuaded to declare a ceasefire in return for political power in Allied controlled North Africa. And he also explains how the Allies encounter more opposition than expected, especially in Casablanca. The Allies will also find out that Peanut may have revealed the whole operation to befriended Nazi collaborators so that they could transfer billions of France in profits to safety. So, was the intelligence operation a failure? Um, no. Not really. Getting the convoys through the Strait of Gibraltar unscathed is a huge thing on its own. Before it happened, one commander said that he would consider his task successful if he got half of his convoy to Algeria and Iran through the expected gauntlet. Eddie's and Rigo's massive signal intelligence and field wars likely saved thousands of lives and will serve as a blueprint for many operations to come. But like most spies, they will remain the unsung heroes of this operation for decades to come. After all, it's all a big secret. What isn't a big secret is that it is thanks to the Tango's army that we can make all of our program. So, Join us at patreon.com or timegoes.tv. Check out the first part of Rigo's story here and Wild Bill Donovan's story 
here. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell and I will see you next time, my wonderful darlings. Thank mm -hmm. you.